by popular demand, I'm taking a look at literal e-waste from China. Okay, not really. It's actually really good. It's surprisingly, shockingly good. It's an 11th gen processor on a desktop motherboard, but the processor was designed for mobile, but it's on a desktop board, and it's soldered, and it's not removable, uh, and it's MATX gaming motherboard, and yet, yeah, for $160, it's kind of a steal. But there's also a lot of quirks, and there's a lot of trade-offs. Uh, let's dive in. All right, first up, the processor. It's a Core i7-11800H. Out of the box, it's pretty locked down in terms of power delivery. It's, it's based around the HM570 slash Z590 chipset. It's dual DDR4 support for 2133 to 3200. Pretty modest, has a built-in gigabit ethernet card. One PCIe X16, one PCIe by one, one PCIe 4.0 by four NVMe slot, and one combo PCIe X4 and SATA AHCL. There's also a, uh, an E-key Wi-Fi slot for Bluetooth, and it's got four SATA 3.0 ports. The rear I.O. is pretty modest, two USB 3 ports, two HDMI, one display port, USB 2.0 gigabit networking, and USB 3, along with a 5.1 channel audio codec. One of the most awesome things about this board is that the BIOS is completely unlocked and there's at least three different options for every uh, single thing that you might want to tweak and some of them don't actually work, so it's a lot of fun. One of the big features of the BIOS is that it has an aging test. You can have it run a self-test for 168 hours to make sure that it's stable, which is really cool. And you need that because you want to run the processor not at its stock defaults. You want to run it at around 100 watts, give or take, because that can be stable and it can be really good. That's sort of where you're going to run into the first quirk with this. Physically mounting the heat sink to the processor, it comes with a shim. The shim isn't the greatest. If you want this thing to run as well as it can possibly run, you're going to want to fiddle with that a little bit. You don't need significant cooling for this. I mean, strictly speaking, it's not a removable processor. It's soldered on. It's BGA, ball grid array. So they have, I had to do some things to make a standard cooler fit here. At 100 watts, you can get 4.6 gigahertz all core in non-AVX loads and 4.3 under AVX loads just because of the heat. And that, you will see a temperature peak. You will see temperature peaks of around 96 C when you're doing artificial benchmarks with these settings, but for gaming workloads, you're more in the 60 degrees C neighborhood. Okay, maybe maybe kissing 70 degrees C with that $30 tower cooler, but our Fantex cooler, which is a little more advanced, had no problem keeping this thing uh, relatively cool. In terms of a general setup recommendation, we definitely would recommend dialing in system stability first and then focus on RAM stability. The RAM stability, you know, 3200, I don't know how well I believe 3200, at least with dual rank configuration, because 32 gigabytes is kind of the sweet spot these days. If you're going to do this, you might as well get 32 gigabytes of memory. Don't let yourself suffer with 16 gigabytes of memory. 2933, pretty easily attainable. 3200, a little bit more of a challenge. And last thing to note before we get to the actual gaming benchmarks is, keep in mind this is Tiger Lake. It does actually have AVX 512, and surprisingly, but maybe not surprisingly if you think about it, the CPU efficiency is through the roof. This 11th gen CPUs actually kind of do rival AMD in terms of energy efficiency. I mean, this is a mobile part that has been juiced for desktop, which is kind of the opposite use case. Mobile is more like the type of binning that Intel does for server CPUs, which is to try to get them as close to efficiency as possible. Whereas on desktop CPUs, they don't care. You just dump as much watts into it as you need and problem solved. But this CPU is stable even at extremely low powers. So if you wanted to get something like this to run for a home server setup, you can, although the lack of PCIe slots is a little annoying for the home user, the home server use case. But at 160-ish dollars for this board, it's kind of a no-brainer. If you're rocking, you know, a 3790K or an i7-2700 or something of that genre, you can't beat $160. It is that mind-blowing. All right, let's take a look at the benchmarks. So this is our plucky little test system in the Fractal Pop Air. And this is really overkill, like I say, you can, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but yeah. Here's our CPU Z screens so that you know what you're getting into with this CPU because this is a very, very off-label use. 
you're depending on some rando in China in order to get your firmware updates and microcode and everything else like that, which is, spoiler alert, you're probably not going to get anything in the way of those kinds of platform updates over the long haul. Because we couldn't get 3200 to be perfectly stable, all of our benchmarks were at 2933 with our DDR4 setup, but hey, it's not bad. And because this is a 7900 XT, there's not really a lot of performance difference between 1080p and 1440p. And that holds true with this processor. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, 1080p, 1440p, it's basically the same because, well, I mean, this is 11th Gen Tiger Lake after all. And 7900 XT, AMD's platform, you probably do a little bit better with a more expensive NVIDIA card, but why would you want to? You can get better overall performance from Team Red in this use case. Uh, the Intel ARC cards also probably wouldn't be a terrible choice, like the A770 with this build could be really good if you're willing to put up with just a little bit of driver uncertainty, but they've gotten a lot better since launch. Even more modern games like Horizon Zero Dawn, over 160 FPS, whether you're rocking 1440p or 1080p, it's not a problem for this platform. Older titles like Borderlands 3, 175 to 200 FPS, depending on what resolution you're targeting. I mean, you could do 4K gaming if you're going for that high end of a build, but this is more to show you that you're not really going to be uh, CPU limited, even with the highest end GPU. Personally, I think something like our Phantom Gaming 6600 XT makes a lot more sense for this build, especially if you can stretch your budget and spend, you know, 300, a little over $300 for your GPU, depending on what's available in the market. And if you don't see something on the used market for your GPU, you know, let's say an X mining card or whatever, that uh, would do really well for the kinds of things that you want to target. A 6600 XT is going to give you everything that you want for 1080p gaming and probably everything that you want for 1440p gaming. You don't need something as high end as the 7900 XT in order to do that. But if you want consistently over 120 FPS, even at 1440p, pretty much any title, even with an 11th gen Tiger Lake mobile CPU that's been sort of Frankenstein crammed into a motherboard, you can do it. For artificial benchmarks like V-Ray and Firestrike, the CPU-GPU combo setup lines up about where you'd think. It's a little off-putting that the CPU shows up as Intel all zeros. Usually that's an engineering sample CPU, but they apparently have thousands or tens of thousands of these, and maybe it varies a little bit from board to board, but, but 11800H is the closest thing to match what we see in CPU-Z, so it's probably that. It might have had to do some black magic in order to get the microcode to initialize the CPU correctly in this sort of desktop scenario. There is one tiny, tiny fly in the ointment that I will mention, and that is in the past when you've done something off-label and too many people have done the off-label thing because it was awesome, uh, Intel has retroactively bricked people using that scenario. The one that immediately comes to mind is uh, there was a Pentium CPU that they accidentally unlocked, and they relocked it with a microcode update. The problem was that if you had a system or a board that allowed you to unlock it, and you unlocked it at the BIOS level, when Windows installed that update and you rebooted, you would get an endless blue screen loop until you cleared your BIOS. Could something like that happen here? Could there be a microcode update that's pushed by Intel through Windows Update, let's say, that turns off the ability to dump arbitrary amounts of, of wattage into your processor, because this processor is really unremarkable unless you can do that 100 watt overclock, because it's running at mobile power limits for thin and light, which is less than exciting. And the answer is a definite maybe, but I think the Intel All Zeros labeling here is a little bit of armor hardening against that. Like, I guess if Intel notices, it would be possible to produce a microcode update that includes an FU specifically for this processor, the way that there was an FU specifically for the Pentium processor that they accidentally unlocked. This is Haswell days, so this has been quite a while ago. Haven't been any examples of that in recent memory that I can think of. The time before that, where I was really salty, was when Intel had registered error-correcting memory support on CPUs like the 7980XE. It worked great, it worked fabulously well, but then there was a microcode update that would disable support for that memory. If you got that microcode update at boot time, your computer would just 
go to a black screen and nothing. But that didn't automatically install. You had to jump through some hoops in order to do that update. And then it was like, well, I can just not run with that update and be fine. If you updated the BIOS on your motherboard to support 9th or 10th generation CPUs, and you weren't using a 9th or 10th generation CPU, your 7th gen CPU would stop supporting registered error correcting memory, whereas previously it did. So you could be left with a system that won't post after a BIOS update because now it's saying, oh, I don't work with that memory anymore. Could something like that happen here? Yes. What do I think the chances of that happening actually are? Very, very slim. Very slim. Okay, for our build, as you saw, we splurged a little bit. We've got a nice cooler, we've got a nice case, we've got a nice power supply for a $160 board. We've even got nice memory. And a 7900 XT for our GPU testing. I mean, yeah, okay, this CPU is not able to peg the 7900 XT at 100% for all of the games. That is definitely a thing that you can see from our benchmarks but it's like 90%, 92%. I guarantee you that 3790K or 4940K or you know your older CPUs are not gonna be able to get anywhere close to the performance of this 11th gen i7 mobile desktop monstrosity. This board has got a lot of quirks and if you make any slight misstep or there's any kind of memory instability, it boom, it resets you back to 2133 and you have to deal with all that again. Super annoying and frustrating, but I guess that's good for stability and you know people that don't know exactly what they're doing and, and everything else. It's an unbeatable value for what it is, but it's a motherboard literally made out of e-waste because I think these are mobile processors that just weren't, un weren't sold, if that uh, sort of follows. So if you're on an extreme budget, don't do what we did and put it in a really nice system. Get some e-waste, like an old Dell e-waste with like a 300 or 400 watt power supply and grab that and put that together in there uh, with that power supply and er everything else. And definitely use a lower end GPU than the 7900 XT, but you could put a 7900 XT. I mean, you could pair that kind of a thing with the system. A 6600 would also be a good pairing for this setup. And you can do that at the 400, 500 watt power range and those power supplies are insanely inexpensive so if you start with an e-waste recycle oem machine that is atx ish and you're handy with a drill and everything else you could get a a, a top 10 percent gaming machine for on the order of like six hundred dollars which is just crazy to me especially if you get a used gpu and you're spending less than three hundred dollars on your gpu it's pretty easy to get a really amazing system for like 600 650 dollars and that's where that's where this thing really shines you're willing to put in the work and you're willing to tweak some things it is doable it's uh it does legit have the goods which is surprising it's like 160 dollars if this video makes the pricing more insane than $160, I don't know that I would bother. I mean, $180, $200, eh, I don't know, because the price of all that stuff's falling and everything else, so I don't know. I'm Woodless Level 1. Big thanks to Gigabuster for helping do all this testing and also sort of being like, you have to do this. You have to do this. And it's like, okay, sounds good. So, yeah, uh, fun times. All right, I'm hanging out in the Level 1 forums. We'll see you there if you got any questions or you want to do any tests or it's like, how does it run this? Let's figure it out. Oh.